Welcome back as we continue with that, I would say, very I would say, relevant and current discussion. Uh, many people talking about this selection of the president, not many of us really equipped with all the information because obviously we have to consider the components of the Constitution as it pertains to the selection of a president. And the Constitution is quite clear. Um, it's really interesting here. It's a write-up again on The Guardian. And it speaks to Chapter 3, Section 23.1 of the Constitution. And I'll probably let Martin George, who joins us on the Zoom line, uh, break it down for us some more, uh, put it to us probably in layman's terms as to what is the requirement. I could safely say one of the requirements would be that the person must be 35 years and over, a resident of Trinidad and Tobago for at least 10 years, and there are other, I would imagine, uh, specifics. But Martin, of course, we are always guided by his counsel. And we look at what's happening with this current situation, Martin. I must say, we have some interesting days to come from now to the 20th. Let me say good morning and Happy New Year. <laughs> yes, Happy New Year to you, Jason, and Happy New Year to Trinidad and Tobago. It's a pleasure, as always. Jason, you know, um, as I said since Saturday, um, it is clear that the government is on solid legal ground in terms of the, you know, nomination of um, Senator Christine Kangaloo in that they have met all the legal requirements. When one looks at Section 23, as you've pointed out of the Constitution, and as I pointed out since Saturday, Section 24, I think, goes to the heart of the matter, which is that issue here, where there has been objection and you, there have been complaints by some in relation to the fact that she is a sitting senator and a member of the parliament but when one looks at section 24 it seems that the framers of the constitution contemplated this very scenario because section 24 speaks to that it says where a member of the senate or the house of representatives is elected as president his seat in the senate or the house of representatives shall be vacated so the the point is if it is that the Constitution itself, in this section that speaks about the president, actually contemplated such a scenario, uh -huh. then that's why since Saturday, I made the public statement saying that, look, let's have reference to the law. Because Jason, I always like to be guided by the law. And when you look at what the law says in Section 24, it is clear that it is possible provision and made. in fact they anticipated yeah. that a sitting member of parliament might be elected as president and i would imagine that's what the prime minister went yesterday equipped with constitution well, in actually hand. i was heartened to see the prime minister make reference to the very same section yeah. that i mentioned since saturday yeah. and he actually you know, mentioned, I, I saw he mentioned it in his press conference yesterday yeah and he actually going even further into that uh well particular role and seat that would be vacant if Ms. Kangalu, Senator Kangalu, goes all the way, which it seems at mm -hmm. this point in time she, she would. Um, he's suggesting here that he has somebody in mind to replace Kangalu in the upper house, but he's not ready to reveal the name just yet. So we'll come to that some at some point later on. But let's, yes. let's, let's continue here with the discussion of the president. Is it by design or is it by, uh, is it deliberate? Is it, is it what's the structure of five out of the last six coming from the legal fraternity could could let's say a president be from the private sector a, a lot of business and industry someone who is well respected of course when you look at the requirements in section 23 there's nothing debarring you know other persons and there's nothing saying that having legal qualifications is a prerequisite in fact Jason, um, it's not necessary at all because you have legal advisors to the office of the president. So why? And the fact that you may have had legal training, one would hope that you would not seek to be advising yourself legally on these issues, but instead you would rely on the advice of you know, the attorneys assigned to the office of the president and seek their guidance. The, um, is the facility of you know having senior counsel's advice if necessary. But, so therefore, it would be very um, you know unique if it is that someone who 
has legal training in the office of the president, seeks to advise himself, because you know the old saying, Jason, um, the lawyer who advises himself has a fool for a client. So therefore, you really should not be um, attempting to do that. So therefore, the question of having legal training is not, um, you know, not necessary at all. Um, I think it's just coincidence rather than, um, you know, any deliberate well, design. Well, I, I, I mean, I, I beg to differ a bit, a bit Martin, because I, I can't see this being, I mean, yes, it could be coincidence, but the fact remains, out of the six who have sat in, in that chair, and the seventh coming in, even if things were to swing to Mr. Khan's, in Mr. Khan's direction, which is highly unlikely, he, again, a legal luminary. So I was always of the opinion to sit in that seat, you had to have at least some kind of legal background. You, it's like a lawyer will have a better chance, as far as I'm concerned, who steps into the particular realm or who steps in to whatever role and function, and you ascend and go up there on the, on the legal charts. I think it's an easier chance for you to become the president, because it's only Mr. George Maxwell Richards, former campus principal of UE and uh, mm -hmm. a, a, a academic mind, uh, you know, educator, he went forward, and he's the only one out of the six. I'm seeing Silas Clark, no rationality. Who, who is an, a non-legal person. Yes, a no, non-legal. So, so, so clearly, it seems like, you know, it, it, it leans more in the direction of those who have a legal background. Um, and I, I still don't think that um, it is deliberate in that regard because I don't think that it's necessary because um, certainly um, whatever legal issues... Um, former President George Maxwell Richards would have had to deal with. Um, I'm sure he acquitted himself quite, you know, competently and capably in that regard because he would have sought appropriate legal advice. So um, it, it, it just appears, it, it's the same with Jason. You see many attorneys ending up as politicians. And, I mean, certainly you don't need legal training to be a politician. Mm. Um, but maybe, I guess, um, if it is that you do possess great advocacy skills and, you know, skills of, you know, being able to present a case and present an argument, maybe that lends itself more naturally to maybe being on a political platform. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure. Mm. <laughs> but, you yeah. know, um, it, it's not a prerequisite at all. Yeah, because I was not going to say to you, Martin, that, you know, you also having a strong legal background, probably one day uh, we could say His Excellency Martin George. You never know, Martin. <laughs> you know, but it, it has nothing good. to do with a legal background. <laughs> <laughs> I want to switch it here, as we would have mentioned, you know, obviously the structure and the legal framework surrounding the selection. Do you think it's time for us to probably have that conversation regarding change, of the process, change in the process of selection of the president? I mean, that's constitutional change. That's a whole different... Um, a whole different, I would imagine, approach and scenario. What, what, what's your take there? You, you, you see, the thing is, um, it's difficult to view that in isolation, Jason, from the entire um, slew of constitutional changes which would then become necessary. So, in other words, it's either we are undertaking a comprehensive constitutional reform you know, such as, you know, was it, um, initially done, if you recall, under the Wooden, um, you know, commission. Then, of course, you had the Sir Ellis Clark Constitution of the 1976. So we need, as a nation, to decide whether that's what we want, and we need to get our politicians on board. Because, Jason, our politicians play these games with us when they are in opposition they keep clamoring for constitutional reform when they are in government they seem to be not very interested in it anymore but then when the tables turn and they are back in opposition all of a sudden you hear them reviving the calls for constitutional reform so um it, it doesn't appear that there's that level of seriousness amongst our politicians in the sense of being able to hold firm to one position to say, well, look, for the good of the nation, we need to set aside our political differences and, you know, come together to achieve this objective. I'm, I'm not sure we are at that level of political maturity yet um, in terms of our representatives who, you know, are there in the um, parliament. Yeah, interesting. Final question, um, you know, I was putting this forward to everyone who 
lent their voice and their opinion on this, uh, I would say, interesting development. Is the rule, as far as you're concerned, through your lens, the rule of the president still a relevant one in 2023? Well, the thing is, um, I think partly it depends upon the office holder to make it as relevant to the public as possible. And that involves you going above and beyond the mere, you know, um, paper title of what a president is. In other words, as president, you are supposed to be the leader, the exemplar, the person who basically, um, if, if, you, if you recall, okay, let, let, let's look at um, uh, an example, Jason. Look at the role of the monarch in Britain. All right. Notwithstanding the fact that Britain would have its prime minister, whenever the queen has to give her throne speech, the entire nation sits and listens. They, you know, they, 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 they would be, you know, enthralled and, you know, in awe. I mean, of course, I'm not sure what the reaction King Charles would get, but um, <laughs> <laughs> the fact is Queen Elizabeth, she lived that role and she made that role relevant and you look at um even princess diana how she you know made her role relevant so it's not just the fact that okay yes it appears that a lot of it is you know rubber stamping and you know you you appear to be a paper tiger it's up to you to make the role come alive make it relevant to the people you need to go out there and live that role as the exemplar and the head of state leading Trinidad and Tobago in that way. You know, you're not at all, you know, stepping on any toes politically or anything so, but in terms of giving that guiding light as head of state, I think it's quite possible for the role to be very relevant. You know, when, when one thinks back to Ellis Clark, I mean, no one could have faulted him in terms of his leadership and the way he, you know, lived that role. You look back even to um, George Maxwell Richards. He himself conducted himself. You had no Hassan Ali, you know, and then you saw even, um, you know, First Lady Hassan Ali. She was so active in so many causes, so many things. Up to this she, day. Up to this day. Very much, very active. Yeah, that's and, right. Yeah, that's yeah. right. So, yeah. as I say, it's up to the individual to make the role. In other words, you must become bigger than the paper title of the role and show that you are true leader for the nation. And I think then you will earn the respect of citizens. Yeah, well said. Uh, thank you for that, Martin. I think visibility is important and everybody you mentioned Of course, there, of course, know, of course. I remember course. I saw Sir, Al Sir Ellis Clark only once in my life, um, Assumption Church, if I'm not mistaken. He went to Sunday Mass. And this was years after he was president, but he stood after the mass, greeting everyone. People, people waited in a line, you know, such, such right. reverence and respect. Yes. And I remember yes. saying to mom, wow, I say Ellis Clark, the former president. You yes. said treat the man like president, even though he was not president. That's right, right. That's right. Because he always comported himself yeah. with yeah. that dignity. Statesman. And I think that's what is important. Yeah. Hey, Martin, thank you so much. All the best. We will touch base. It's always a pleasure. Yeah, always. And we'll, we'll monitor the story, morning. and probably after we'll have a postmortem on the selection after the 20th of January. Indeed, indeed. Thank you. <laughs> All the best, Martin George, touching have base. Have a great morning. Yeah, you too. Uh, let's get ready for the child rights and gender activist, Marcus Kassoon. Going to touch base as we get into that whole discussion of the protection of our children. We saw that story out of Sandy Grandy. We saw in the papers today what happened close to me in San Juan over the weekend. What are we doing? Where are we going as it pertains to the vulnerable, the young ones, the ones we should be really looking after and protecting? Let's have that discussion up next.